Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing to all us this day. We thank you for the word that we have heard and pray, Lord, now that our meditation on this word, again, will be guided by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that this word may take root in us, established, being established in such a strong way, O oh Lord, that we may, with anticipation, be awaiting for you to come again, our King and our Lord and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. For what are you hoping this holiday season? For what are you hoping? I see several college students out there. You're hoping for passing grades, right? End of the semester. A lot of heads going up and down on that one, right? Right? A lot of heads going up and down on that one. You know, I think sometimes, and this is not about what do you want to get for Christmas as a gift. This is about what are you hoping for? I have a suspicion that some folks are hoping that maybe their loved one that's serving in the military will get to come home and spend some time at Christmas. Maybe some folks are hoping that their whole family will be able to gather together this Christmas. Maybe some folks are hoping that some relatives that they haven't seen for a long time they might get to see this Christmas. Maybe they're just hoping for safe travels as they journey to different places. I'm always reminded when I think about what are you hoping for, I'm reminded of the Miss America pageant. You know, they always talk to the Miss America contestants and say, what do you hope for in this world? And they'll rattle off with a bunch of things, then they'll say, and what? World peace. Right? And world peace. Sally and I had the opportunity several years ago, each independently of each other, to be host to Miss America. Katie Stan, host them at different events. And uh, she told us that, at least she told me, I don't know if she shared this with Sally or not, but uh, she told me that when she was done with her Miss America reign and a few years down the road, she wanted to write a book, the title of the book, And World Peace. Right? That basic response that you get every time from these pageants. But I'm telling you, I don't think we're going to see it. We're in a sinful, fallen, broken world. World peace is just a dream in somebody's mind. But the good thing is that God gives us a promise of a peace that's not dependent on world peace. Rather, the peace that passes all understanding that he alone can grant us. Scripture reading today from Romans 15. We talk about the God of hope filling us with all joy and peace. See, that's where peace comes from, isn't it? It's when the Lord fills us. When the Lord fills us with the gifts that he can grant us, words, sacrament, all that he gives us. That's what we're look at today. How does the God of hope fill you? What hope does he give you in your life? I'm going to start with this reading from Romans 15, the very first part of that reading, which reads, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Endurance. You know, it's based upon the Word of God, because the Word of the Lord endures. Right? What does the Scripture say? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Because the word of the Lord endures forever, that means the hope that he gives us endures forever. You know, a lot of the books of the New Testament, even oh, talk about times of persecution for the people, times of ridicule that we hear about today in our world, about Christians. We hear about those kinds of things. But the word of the Lord helps us to endure in the face of any kind of harassment we may face, even in the face of disappointment in this world. The word of God brings us hope. And encouragement. And encouragement. My friend Paula Ross, we've been praying for her over the past months. And uh, Paula, when Paula and I have known for each other since I was a fourth year seminary student. I, I began to work at the International Center of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Center part time. And she and I shared a, we called it the closet because they converted a big storage closet into an office. And she and I shared this office with another person. And, and we knew each other a long time. Paula was a lot of fun to be around. And Paula had one of those, you remember those little things you could hook on your keychain? If you couldn't find your keys, you could clap, right? And it would beep so you could find your keys. Remember those? It's been a long time ago, right? You find those things? Paula had bought one of those because she was always losing her keys. She had it in the office and she would go, nothing would happen. She'd go, nothing would happen. I'd go, her keys would go off. 
I told her, well, Paul, if you can't ever find your keys, call me. I'll come clap for you and we'll find your keys, right? Well, the last time, of course, I was at, working at the International Center, we were elected out of office when I was working for the president. And we weren't really sure where we were going to go, what we were going to do. We didn't know what the future held at that moment. But Paula gave me a scripture as a word of encouragement. Scripture, you may know it, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's. I'm sorry, declares the Lord, right? And here's the plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Encouraging words. Especially when you don't know what your future is. When you don't know what's around the corner. I mentioned Paula, we've been praying for her. She had stage four breast cancer. Paula passed away November the 13th. But before she died, she sent out this message. She said, as many of you know, I've been fighting stage four breast cancer for some 20 months. Now that I've exhausted all of my treatment options, I ask for your continued prayers as I start in-home hospice, the final leg of my earthly journey. Thanks so much for your love and concern, messages of support and prayers. I know this is a shock to some of you. You know where she got her from, don't you? From God's Word. From God's Word, she knew what the future held for her. From God's Word, she knew that no matter the circumstance of life, yes, even facing hospice and death at that moment, there was that awesome silver lining because God's Word was encouraging her. You know, in times like that, we have this promise in 1 Thessalonians 4 that says, We do not grieve as others who do not have hope. The apostle goes on and writes, encourage each other with these words. You see, God's word, it causes us to endure, but it also encourages us. I'm very sensitive to this time of year. Because I know folks that have lost maybe someone they love this past year, that the holidays are really hard. It's your first time this Christmas holiday without. But here's the deal, God's word gives us hope. It's like it did Paula. She knew the silver lining. She knew what was ahead for her. And while the grief may come rushing back, I pray God's hope comes in stronger. Sustains you with his promises of this child that was born in Bethlehem, the child of the Savior that was born for you and for me. See, God fills us with hope through his word. But we also find other things that he does. How he fills us with hope during these days. He pulls us together as the family of God. And the verses read, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope fills us with harmony. The NIV translates this as a spirit of unity. Literally, we give to you to mind the same thing among one another. The same kind of language is used in Philippians 2, too, where it says, be of the same mind or be thinking the same things. Because you see what happens when we're believing the same things that God has given us to believe, we have harmony with one another. And we walk together in his word because we know we have this common Savior as our Savior. And we walk together in that word. See, there's peace and hope and support in that time. The scriptures say how good it is when brothers live together in harmony. It's kind of like a nice symphony, all working together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And when it all comes together, we have that one voice. We have that one voice that declares Jesus as Savior and Lord. We have that one voice that gives us peace. Because we know, as even as we confess in our creeds every week, we hold this common belief that God has granted us and given us as his people. With one voice, we speak of his love. With one voice, we're united for the cause of the gospel. And with one voice, we glorify our God in heaven. There's hope in that harmony. There's hope in that word that is ours, that God has granted us. There's also hope and peace, I believe, in this other section of the scripture. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Christ welcomes us unconditionally. 
He welcomes us with an everlasting and never-ending love. You know, true friends are unconditional friends. They continue to love you and care about you no matter what. They stand beside you through the ups and downs of life. We welcome friends, don't we? Don't wel doesn't welcoming friends give us a sense of peace and hope in our lives when we see someone we haven't seen for a long time? And there they are, right there to support you, to stand beside you. You grant, you give them hugs. They hug you. You know that, that just that time is lifting your spirits because that's somebody special that God has put in your life. I would say welcoming strangers fits in the same category. You know, in the Hebrews, they're reminded to welcome the strangers and entertain the strangers because in doing so, some have welcomed and entertained angels. You know, and that's a special gift, that welcoming gift. Where I grew up over at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Temple, Texas, my mom and dad were known as the unofficial greeters of Emanuel Lutheran Church. Their name was never on any list or anything. They just stood at the door as people left and talked to them and welcomed them and, and visited with them. I probably shared with you before, you know, there were many times that they would meet somebody Sunday morning and pretty soon those people were at our, at our table that, at dinner. Yeah, dinner was noon, right? Dinner table that day. See, they had that gift of hospitality. They welcome strangers. Sometimes I think we lose some of that. Sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in our lives we can't look outside and see what we need to be doing to welcome others into what we have. My mom always used to say, it's just another potato in the pot. That's going to be the book I'm going to write someday. It might not be very long, but just some thoughts about that hospitality that my parents showed as they showed their love for Christ to others. I believe another thing that gives us hope, the way God fills us, is truly filling us with joy and peace in believing. That's what the word says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You see, when we believe, when we believe all that God has done for us, we believe everything that he's written for us in his word, suddenly all those promises come through. Like, what can man do to us? Or no one can snatch them out of my hand. See, he empowers us with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that joy and that peace comes through that hope. You know, I'm talking about Emmanuel Luther over in the temple. When I was a kid, my, my, one of my best friends, and uh, Les Winkler, his dad passed away, Gus passed away. And we were, we were like young, we were, we were teens and stuff. And I remember standing in the hallway when, when his uncle, Uncle George, came by, Reverend George Winkler came by. And he stopped there and stood with us boys. We were all standing there with our friend Les. And, and he said, boy, this is a joyous, this is a great and joyous day. And I was saying, what are you talking about? This guy's dad just died. Your brother just died. And he said, we get to gather together and we get to glorify and praise Jesus in time of worship. And my brother's with Jesus today. Joy and peace in belief. Joy and peace in believing. And it's all fulfilled through Jesus. The scripture also reads, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Christ came to be our servant. He testified of that, didn't he? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. He came to this earth, born that child, but to live and to go die on the cross for our sin. Our forgiveness. Jesus did all of this to ransom us, snatch us out of the hand of the devil and give us hope. Give us hope that is ours because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, he said, thus all these promises are confirmed right through Jesus. As it's written, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, and him will the Gentiles hope. We heard that in, in Isaiah 11 today, right? That shoot from Jesse that came, the one that came to be our king. Christ came to confirm all of these promises of God for us to fill us with the hope that is ours. And it's all ours because it's been confirmed in our baptisms, washed again in water in the word. What a powerful gift that is to us, that we may be the children, the king's kids. It's ours because he put himself on us, 
All right, so we put on Christ, which really God putting Christ on us. And then all these promises are ours. Earlier in the book of Romans chapter 8, again, some familiar words. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how would he not also with him graciously give us all things? And he continues, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What promises, what hope we have. This is the God that fills us. This is the thing that we hope for during this season, that we will be filled with God's joy and peace that to him will be all glory as we sing in that song, to God be the glory, great things he has done, right? Great things he has done. So I close with these words again from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may have hope. Let us pray. God, you've given us your holy word. You've called us together as your children in the body of Christ. You've put upon us to welcome one another in your unconditional love. To you fill us with joy and peace. And it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of what he has done for us. So Lord, today as we move through this Advent season, through this Christmas season, may the one thing for which we are hoping be that being filled with your grace, your mercy, your love, your joy, your hope, and your peace. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church.